This episode features Dr. Lachlan James and Dr. Stephen Duick. Dr. Lachlan James is a senior lecturer, sports scientist, and course coordinator of the Master of Strength and Conditioning degree at La Trobe University in Melbourne, Australia. Dr. Duick is a lecturer in exercise science at Griffith University in Brisbane, Australia. Hosting with me is Dr. Patrick Holmberg, and uh, we have uh, fresh in from a long flight, Lachlan James and Steve Duig. I'll let these guys kind of give a brief intro to who they are and what they do, um, and then we'll get into a discussion. Lachlan? All right. Thanks for having us, guys. Really flattered to be here, excited to be here as well. So uh, my name's Lachlan James. I'm a senior lecturer and researcher at La Trobe University in Melbourne, Australia. So, so my job these days, it's a third lecturing and teaching strength conditioning students, uh, probably a third in applied research for strength and conditioning, and the, the other third is supervising research projects embedded within professional organisations or our institutes of sports in Australia. So that, that's my job now, but I'm not your typical academic, so I started off as a practitioner for the first 10 years of my career uh, in SNC and applied sports science before in 2014, um, moving back home to Brisbane, Queensland, where I uh, did my PhD, investigating MMA athletes, and then from there made the transition over from being a, a practitioner to being sort of an academic and a researcher, and that sort of brings me to where I am today. And again, excited to have you both. Uh, this is an unbelievable opportunity to have a wonderful chat uh, about strength and its importance to athletic performance. And I must say, um, as a PhD student currently, Lachlan James is one of my supervisors. Hmm. So again, very humbled for him to be here. Stephen Duig uh, attended and did his PhD at Queensland University of Technology, where I'm at now under uh, Tony Shield. So again, I'm just looking forward to the conversation and joining in when I can. So appreciate you having us. Yes, of course. Can you give a brief intro on who you are and what you do? Certainly. Firstly, thanks for the, the last minute invite to, uh, to jump in on the, the podcast. <laughs> I a bit of a, a gate crash there, just turned up and um, bang, you put up another seat. So thank you. Beautiful part of the world in um, where we're at the moment. This is uh, coming from LA. We spent a, a few nights there. Up here, it's, it's amazing. So yeah, my name's Dr. Stephen Duhigg. I'm an academic. I identify as a strength and conditioning coach, but that doesn't pay my bills. So I have to say I'm an, I'm an academic. So I work in exercise and sport at Griffith University on the Gold Coast in Australia. My focus is on injury prevention and also sports performance. So very much focused on ath the athlete rather than general pops. And, and as you alluded to earlier, I've done my, my PhD, I, I did on hamstring strains with the, the impressive Tony Shield, who we all know from co-inventor of Nordboard and, and numerous contributions to literature through, through hamstring strain research. So very fortunate to be a part of, of, uh, of that very special team. I've um, yeah, as, as I mentioned, human performance or sports performance, and um, I, I branched from there. I, I look at some ACL stuff. I did my, my ACL, actually, so lucky enough to get onto some research that's uh, associated with that, and, and more recently, you know, looking at, at determinants and, you know, associations between sports performance and, and injury risk. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's great to be here. Um, I'm, I'm not actually currently at the university at the moment. I've been seconded to General Electric Healthcare, so I'm actually um, helping them develop one of their, their shoulder applications for ultrasound just to um, in, enhance the, the user experience and, and enable them to, to scan all of the, the major structures within the shoulder. So I've got a very, uh, very diverse uh, portfolio. And um, I did say that, you know, I'm an SNC coach. And I work with the, the Burley Bears that are a, the, the, a Queensland Cup team. So essentially they're a, um, they're a, a semi-elite Okay, and I won't say sub-elite, I'll say semi-elite. We, um, we're the reserve grade, if you like, for the, the National Rugby League, the NRL, which is our, our top level, our elite level, but we have guys drop down into the, into the cup and, and they'll play. So it's, um, you know, the, the guys go all up down the coast, head over to Papua New Guinea, they actually got a really good win over there um, just on the, the weekend. So yeah, I've got a, a, a very, as I said, diverse um, portfolio and I get a good spread of all things academia, you know, the theory and the practical side and, and then being able to, to implement my research and into that, uh, into the field. So yeah, again, thanks for, for having me. 
Um, so just to give a bit of a backdrop, um, Lachlan put out a paper earlier this year, correct? Yeah, yeah. It probably went out to the late last year. Now has been a side an issue, so it's kind of out there now. Been out there for about six months or so. Absolutely. And so the title of the paper is Strength uh, Classification and Diagnosis, uh, Not All Strength is Created Equal. Uh, and when I read this paper, I found it quite interesting, particularly as a practitioner for many, many years. And what it does, in my opinion, is simplify the monitoring process, as well as the assessments that perhaps can give us the most information and or bang for our buck when we're uh, looking at what might be limiting performance with on our athletes. And so my first question as we set this discussion up is if you can just provide your definition of strength. Yeah, of course. Thanks Thanks for the feedback, Pat. Um, it was an important paper that we put together we sort of felt was needed. So the definition of strength uh, is considered the ability to produce force. And, but that can be context and constraint specific. So you can produce force in a number of different ways. And then what we tried to do in this paper was capture the distinct number of ways that typically exist. So we know what is similar and what is different. And that way we can try to capture everything or maybe just a few things in our strength assessment process. And Stephen, when we talk about strength, and your background in terms of looking at reduction in injury, um, how might strength be associated with um, strategies that then reduce the chance for injury among athletes? Can we say prevent? We can say prevent. <laughs> Absolutely. I was very careful with that term. <laughs> I could see you dancing around that. <laughs> Absolutely. Look, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll put my head out there and, and, and let everyone chop it off. Yeah, you look, you know, we say prevent and... Look, in, in my opinion, and you know, it's shared with, with a few others, um, you know, if you can pre prevent one injury, you know, then that is a prevention, right? But it, essentially, the, you know, the concept of, of, um, of injury is, 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 is quite basic, right? If, you're, if you have a, a material that's exposed to an external uh, stimulus or you know, stress um, that is greater than that, that material's property, it's going to break, right? So if you can strengthen that material, and in this terms, we have our, our tissue, you know, whether it be muscle, tendon. If we can strengthen the material properties of that tissue, then it's essentially able to withstand greater external forces. So that's, that's I guess, how strength falls into the, the injury prevention realm. And, you know, we talk about different types of strength. And, and obviously, again, within the muscle, it is strength, absolutely. But, you know, it's, you've got passive elements, you've got contractile or active elements. So it's, it's about increasing strength through all of those those components so what i hear is strength force production transmission toleration of high forces relative to an individual's mass within that given context and so if i turn to lachlan how might that then be related or associated with improved athletic performance yeah, so I guess uh, the question is, you know, the association between an improvement in a given strength quality and improvements in athletic performance. So it's really hard to establish a cause and effect relationship with a lot of the sports we deal with because they're so open and dynamic, particularly your field-based court sports. But when we look at associations, so you look at statistical associations between um, high versus lower level players in a given team or between you know, maybe ladder position, different sort of outcomes, the association between the ability to impart force and high level performance is, is quite strong. So it does appear to exist. The question then becomes, which of those strength qualities is most relevant or is relevant and isn't relevant? Because as, as the title of the paper suggests, they're not all created equal, there are different ones. So to just say strength is important in this sport, well, which form of strength are we talking about? Because they're all a little bit different, although there's some interrelationships there, that they are distinct. But to answer the question is, there's, there are empirical associations that you can draw between the outcome of a sport, so you know, selected, non-selected, pro, semi-pro, elite, sub-elite, and those who are stronger and those who are weaker. So we do that. You, you can take a little bit of a, a technical or a mechanistic look at the the actions within a sport to draw associations between them. So for example, maybe you've got high speed collisions, right? So high forces at fairly high speeds. And from there you can extrapolate, we might need this form of strength. 
Or maybe, let's say you're in a, a, a scrum in rugby and you've got high forces expressed over longer periods of time, you might go, okay, there's a relationship there um, from a technical standpoint. Or let's say the different forms of jumps that occur in basketball, for example. Do you come off a single leg from a run-up? Is it a, a single-step approach off two legs? And you can start to do a technical analysis on that and then hypothesise what strength qualities might be relevant. So you've got that way and then you've got the, the statistical associations that you can do to establish which qualities are, are relevant and which are not. Anything to add, Steve? No, it was a, that's a nice overview of the, the strength, yeah, yeah, I like that. So I guess, you know, the ultimate question that all sport coaches want to know is, you know, what is the relationship between strength, particularly in the weight room, and performance outcomes? And or injury prevention. So, you know, you, def you, you mentioned how different, you know, definitions can be based on sport, athlete, position, even within the same sport. It becomes hard as a strength and conditioning coach to, you know, look at all that different, all those different qualities and, and come up with a, a, a training plan that you can trust will transfer because transfer is everything. So I guess my question is, you know, what is then, you know, the quote unquote holy grail transfer for strength? You know, I, I see uh, conversations on Twitter even, you know, today about, you know, these different arguments. And they say, you know, S&C has had the same debate for decades on strength and its performance or in its relation to performance, you know. And it's like, you know, strength coaches are reductionists or things like that. So it's like, you know, what, what really then is the ultimate uh, driver of performance and injury prevention as it relates to strength? Yeah, good question. So there's a little bit to unpack there, mm -hmm. um, if I may. So you, in, the, in the paper that we discussed, we tried to empirically determine, so using sort of statistical approaches, what distinct strength qualities exist because there's all these metrics and all these tests out there that be can become overwhelming. And so we decided to simplify it. And we sort of, based on what we could see in the literature, and we need to sort of test this going forward in some longitudinal studies or some, some upcoming studies, is it seems to be five distinct strength qualities, generally speaking, right? And so that's sort of your maximal isometric strength, which might be like peak force from mid-thigh pull, and you have explosive strength, which is the, the early part of the force time curve from that mid-thigh pull. Then you have your heavy dynamic strength, which is something like your, your 1RM or your 3RM back squat deadlift power clean. And then you'll have what we call your, your light dynamic strength or your fast dynamic strength, which is what we colloquially call power. So that's your counter movement jump or your squat jump. And then finally, what seems to sit separate from all of those is uh, the quality called reactive strength, which is your fast stretch, stretch shortening cycle action. So that's uh, an action that occurs in less than 250 milliseconds. So sort of with that in mind from the strength quality standpoint, and then to answer the question of what's most relevant, you need to build, this is for any of your physical qualities, you need to build a performance model, right, for your sport. And so at the very top of your performance model will be the outcome, right? That would be the win or a loss, the selected versus non-selected, or some really key within-game performance indicators that you feel are, are relevant to your sport. So that's at the top of your model. And then underneath that, you may or may not have some sort of a sport-specific test, okay, that replicates that. For a lot of our open sports, you know, our field-based team sports, it's kind of hard to, to get that because you need to have some sort of a, a cognitive element to it. For, for closed sports, it might be a, a bit easier. But you might have some sub-elements that you take from sports. So let's say you might have a particular sort of jump that you might use for basketball or for um, triple jump. Or you might have, let's say, punching impact force, for example, for boxing or for a combat sport. That's like your sports-specific test. That, that should have a really tight relationship to those outcome measures that we just discussed before, the wins and losses. But that, that's not always the case. You may not always have that valid test there in most of the open sports that we deal with. So that's fine. Then kind of your next layer are your, your physical qualities, right? And that's what we're talking about here. And then we've kind of stratified that into the strength qualities, which is what we're talking about here. And then within those strength qualities, yet again, you seem to have roughly five. So what you then have to do is try to find links or associations between those strength qualities and the next step in your model, which might be that sport-specific test, or straight through to the, the outcome, which might be the win or a loss selected versus non-selected. And drawing those statistical associations can start to help you determine which of those qualities are most relevant and which are, are, are less relevant. So 
by doing that, you can then start to define your performance model for your sport, for the position within the sport as well. So it's going to be different depending on what you're dealing with. So you've got to have a model or a framework to use to help you get to the right answer. So that's probably how I would answer that question, which is a really big workaround without giving you an answer. But that, that might be how I'd go about it. Um, Steve, what would be kind of some of your approaches to define your performance model or what's important? sports yeah I think you've done a pretty good job in, in covering that all I, I think the only the only addition that I have is is playing style as well so you've obviously got requirements of the sport positional requirements but then playing style and every every player um, interacts and expresses himself while playing is, is very unique so you, you might have someone that's a, a diesel and just goes all day but perhaps doesn't they're not really a high speed or, or x factor they you know you they're your meat and, and um, potatoes and, and they, they just get the, the job done. And then you might have someone else that's completely x factor dynamic. And, and you know, if you, if you think about the, the physical characteristics between the two, you know, you might have someone that's just, you know, their, their overall load in terms of, you know, like the reactive strength isn't very high. And if, you, if you're trying to, you know, provide the same program for, for each of those, I think you might start to run a bit of trouble with, you know, working on, you know, strengths and weaknesses for both, but then, also, from your, you know, your injury prevention perspective, perhaps those that are more dynamic, agile, um, you know, very quick, fast, then you, you've got to give them a, a little bit more attention because we do see you, know, you run fast and um, you know, hammies occur, right? Or if you're very agile, ACLs go. So I think you need to really make sure that you understand each of those, those player-specific styles, which is um, yeah, something you should include. Uh, the question as it relates to you know, strength and its place in, in sport, I, you know, I think it's, it's undeniable and I, I, I certainly wouldn't argue that it, it, um, it, it, it hasn't got its place, but I think it's all about time, right? Like it's all about investment and you really need to be quite crafty with your, your periodization in terms of, okay, like we, we will focus on, you know, this component here, that component there. Yes, if you can get really strong, you can see some transference to, you know, velocity and acceleration, but how much time do you really have to get to you know, a 250 kilogram back squat. You know, it's, it takes a lot of time um, and, and that's, a, you know, that's a premium, isn't it? Especially in your, your sub-elite sports or your, you know, your development, you know, your junior development um, programs. It's, it's something that you as a coach, and that's where it gets tricky, right? And we can really earn our, our and, and, and really cement our spot as a, a good practitioner or coach with our ability to, to know the craft and be able to, to change based on what we're trying to focus on. I think that's a really good point. Sorry, Pat, I no, no. I think that's a really good point. Is is the time cost involved, right? Mm. So that's everything is the time cost versus benefit or a cost mm. versus benefit, right? Which raises the question of how strong is strong enough that people that, that is often discussed within S and C literature. My my answer to that would be what Steve's answer was, which is when the time cost associated with getting that extra kilogram or newton stronger mm. is outweighed by the, ad, the benefits you'd get from spending that time somewhere else, then that is strong enough at that point in time for that given quality. And I think it would depend on the context too and the quote-unquote skill that's involved with the primary tasks of the activity. And so you might have skills that, um, or activities that are more skill-based versus more dependent on physical capacities or the expression of those physical capacities. But I think, to your point, Stephen, the planning mm. and the time and the costs on the back end of those training sessions and how they may disrupt movement coordination, which mm. may then influence injury uh, <clears throat> likelihood or chance for injury. Um, and what I see in the States in particular is we have sporting organizations, whether they're professional and or NCAA, that have limited uh, task-specific activities and or sport-specific practices. Um, and that what has occurred is strength and conditioning has then filled those time slots. And so now the efforts become concentrated within SNC, and that has become our measures which then determine are we actually improving within the off seasons in particular. And what we also find then is we're not actually practicing our skills, so we're not actualizing the increases in force development or force output within the skilled movement. And then I don't know if we actually measure um, strength or force production within skilled movements well yet. Mm. And just because we cannot measure does not mean that practicing that skill then improves force output and vice versa. It's a, it's a complicated multifactorial topic, isn't it? And, you know, we like to see sort of linear associations and clear black and white answers. 
but you know the human system's dynamic. Um, it is bound by some fundamental rules, but the sporting domain is dynamic too. And of course, that's dependent by the sport. Uh, as we were saying before, a lot of our, our team-based, field-based sports quite dynamic. It's hard to pin anything down, right, to determine a cause and effect. And this relates to this. A little bit different in a, in a closed sport, something like track and field, for example. You can start to look a bit more mechanistically at that and start to sort of identify a transfer and measure things, measure the performance directly, which sort of speaks to what you're saying. But it is a complicated scenario that we have to unpick as SNC coaches or applied sports scientists to know look, what is it that we need to target? Because that's going to be your job, right? You're going to come in and you go, okay, we need to perform a needs analysis to determine what are we going to do with our time with this athlete. We're given this number of hours per week to do our job and how do we do that in the best way that fits in what with what the demands of the sport are, the needs of the individual athlete are, and to Steve's point, the playing style of that given squad or club. And then so you need to perform your analysis on that to then inform what it is you're going to do. And there's only so many hours in the day, isn't there? Right. Mm-hmm. So yes, you can never be strong enough if you have unlimited time in the day, but you don't have unlimited time in the day, you've got a fixed amount of time. So what are you going to do in that time that's going to serve the playing model, the athlete, and the organization the best. And to your point about strength conditioning filling that void of restrict time restrictions in the NCAA and professional sport, we had a conversation the other day. It's like, okay, do strength coaches then see themselves as more valuable than they are, right? Is, is the athlete better served just playing their sport more and practicing their skill more? Do we, do we always have to try to, you know, make ourselves as more – Mm. valuable and or more important than we think we are you know so sometimes you know maybe the answer is that athlete needs to play their sport more they need to be become better skilled at their sport yes or no well i think to, to these gentlemen's point um trying to identify what is limiting performance mm. and that is a heck of a puzzle to solve what is limiting that athlete's performance when in, in this context um and that takes quite a general perspective. And perhaps um, within our research, and you are more accomplished researchers in academia, but we are have a very siloed approach within our research and therefore state, well, this may be limiting performance within this, within this context. And therefore, we then start to um, solely identify and address that. Where maybe if we had a more generalist understanding as well as an understanding of the sport in itself, we may be able to figure out or identify what is limiting performance of that individual? Yeah, I I think so. And I think a step towards solving those problems and going through that methodology is working from the organisation forwards as opposed to going from the researcher to the organisation. So a lot of the Mm. the work that that Steve and I do is embedded with organisations and clubs. And then the research question is primarily driven by them. This is... This is the problem we're trying to solve within our organisation. Um, let's see if we can work together to, to solve that problem. And as I said before, it's, it may in part be related to strength, but it's always multifactorial, right? So you're looking at other elements and you're bringing in multiple different perspectives. So you might bring in like an, an analytics or even a mathematical type perspective to solve some complicated problems in determining the, the KPIs for the sport, right? the within-game KPIs, which then helps to inform what your physical KPIs are. So that holistic approach is important and it's vital. And I think if the question's driven by the organisation, then that's probably a step in the right direction to answer those applied questions. So what are kind of your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think like, just speaking to the, the, um, the sport-specific tests, so the, um, for those that are, that are listening that are um, not within Australia, we, we in Australia have got two rugby codes. We've got rugby union, which is probably, if you're in the US, you probably think that that's the only game, but we also have the greatest game in the world, rugby league. And uh, rugby league's very similar to union, but it's, it's different. But if you are, so if you're listening and you're in SNC, we've got really good gigs over, over in, in Oz. But as, a, as an SNC coach, I think that 
the rugby codes, and I'll speak to rugby league because that's the sport that I'm working at the moment, but I've, I've worked in union before, it is the best for a strength and conditioning coach. You'll get, you know, in the, the semi-elite environment, <clears throat> you'll have an hour in the gym, you'll have an hour or more on the field for skills, but the beauty of it is that we have metrics in the game that can assess our ability as strength and conditioning coaches. So before I was, when I was appointed at the Burley Bears, prior to that, it had a very much aerobic focus. And people say, oh, you know, aerobic focus. Some people say that one way is better than the other. And I'm not for that at all. And they saw success. You know, a couple of premierships in the time that SNC coach was there. Really good coach, you know, a lot of energy. But it was an aerobic focus. And they wanted to change. So they wanted a, a strength, power, speed focus, which is, you know, that's my forte. So I came in with, with that in mind. And, and one of the KPIs, or well, the KPIs that you have first and foremost, and I'm not being biased because I'm injury prevention background, but your soft tissue injuries. Can you reduce your non-contact soft tissue injuries? If they're happy with that, great. The next one is the in-game metrics. So we have line breaks, is where you, you get through the line and you've made it past the defensive line and you're heading for your try where you can score. You have then your, your uh, tackle breaks. So in rugby league, you'll run the ball and you know, generally at two very large men, like there'll be three men in the tackle, but you're trying to break through that that tackle right against two guys so that's another metric that you can use and then you've got post contact meters so you'll you'll hit up and then you'll keep driving the legs to try to push and get more more yardage right and so that's beautiful right and and the thing is with rugby with you know rugby league and, and those metrics you know as an snc you can obviously improve acceleration you can improve strength you can improve speed so that that, that covers all of those metrics and there's also a correlation between those so we you know we finished at the top of the um, table for those metrics and we also finished minor premiers so we at the top of the table at the end of the the home and away season so you can use those metrics to assess are we getting more powerful are we getting stronger we're we getting faster and if you're leading the competition in those metrics it's correlated to the ladder position as well and that's performance so it's a beautiful beautiful structure as i was saying snc pumping it up in Oz, you know, we've got these great sports that you as an SNC can say, boom, look at this. Reduced your, you know, prevent it. <laughs> non contact injuries. You saw me dancing, <laughs> <laughs> We're going to be in trouble. Um, you know, and, and these KPIs, look at this, like line, you know, line breaks, tackle breaks, post contact meters, like bang. And so we've really got, and we don't do te much testing. You know, in, the, in pre season, we'll do, you know, the, the big lifts, you know, you, you pull up your deadlift, your squat, your bench, and just so we can individualise our core lifts. And, you know, we change the focus throughout the pre-season. But in, in season, we don't, we don't test. Like, we've got our tests with our KPIs in game. So it's, mate, it's beautiful to have that. So if you can try to find, you know, get crafty with, with how you think about your, your in-sport, you know, in-performance tests and, and correlate them with what you're doing in the gym, you don't always need to be doing your, your strength tests because, it, you know, the proof's in the pudding. Yeah. Are you running those numbers from in-house data or are you like pulling that from literature? Yeah, that's, so we, we collect, so those, those, those KPIs, all those metrics are collected game day. Yep, and then you know, there's a nice correlation between just looking at that and where you finish in the, on the ladder. So it's, you know, and then you, look, I'm, ta I'm, I'm, I'm putting my, my coaching hat on and sometimes we can uh, call it a bit more of an art than a science, mm. but it's, you know, it, it, intuitively it makes sense, right? Like if you can make, if you can push against two big men that are trying to stop you from moving forward, you know, you could say that that's strength, right? And, and different qualities of strength, as you, as you spoke to, you know, your, your top velocity, you know, you're working on more sprint stuff, you know, you're getting the, the sleds out. And, and I certainly work across the whole spectrum of, you know, 10% body weight, 20, 30, I then go even heavier and have like 80 kilos on a prowler and, you know, you get a moving and, and inter interchanging with, with who's pushing that sled across the grass. And then in the gym, we've got heavy, you know, heavy push, pull, lateral movements because you know that that's reflective of, of what you're doing in the game so it's very much specific from the different angles that you need to move in the different weights that you've got to lift and, and you know covering acceleration top velocity and also your ability to to crash through the, the defensive line yeah and so i think this leads perfectly into our next question which is if you were in a club environment and rugby league could be an example uh, how would you then set up your testing and monitoring protocol? It's a great question. I feel, I feel like I'll let Steve answer first because you just yeah. gave such a good answer then and I'll, uh, yeah. I'll give my two cents after that in case, in case what I'm going to say yeah. he disagrees with. No, I <laughs> served it up. No, you, go, you go first, mate. Yeah, so I think like the testing, so again, at the, you know, the, the semi-elite level, you, know, you don't have much time. You know, you've got in-season, Monday's about recovery, 
You know, it's, it's essentially it's a, it's an, a coordinated car crash because these guys are just bang, bang, bang. They're big boys, they're strong. Um, if, you've, if you've seen it, you know, they're, they're, they're big units. So, you know, you've got to give them time to recover. You know, they play on a Saturday, you know, Monday night is, we do a little light lift just as, as part of, you know, um, trying to get that, um, that stimulus again. Wednesday, depending on how they feel, that's our main lift. And then Friday's a captain's run, get ready for the game. So it's about recovery in season as like most collision um, or field or team-based sports. So the, you know, again, don't have much time. So you've got to pick and choose, you know, what are you going to get big, biggest bang for buck, right? Um, if you've got the, the technology there, great. But if you don't, you know, you've got to use your, your own you know, ability to understand the, the literature and, and also what's worked for you in, in the coaching sense to choose the, the most appropriate tests. So we don't do much testing. If we can get some tech out there, we might look at, you know, hamstring strength, might do some force plate. One thing that I, I did like was the, um, you know, in terms of teaching to lift and, and especially in, 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 in rugby league, going to failure obviously, and in all sports, if you go to failure, you're likely gonna get sore. It'll also be pretty taxing on the central nervous system and big fan of the, the velocity based training. And I think, you know, if you can get those type two B fibers recruited through neural drive, you know, intensity of effort, you don't need to go to failure. You're still getting that, that desired adaptation outcome. Um, and I've, I've implemented, you know, some measures, you know, the, the gym aware to show the boys that, you know, if you want your power output, if you want that, that velocity, like, you know, let's, let's actually give it some, you know, control the lower and then really explode through that lift and you're going to get more bang for your buck. So, you know, it's things like that, you know, it's just about education of, of, of training, you know, putting some big lifts in there, but that was more for individualization and, and look, as a, you know, as an academic, you know, mid-career now, I sort of, I like to think that I, I know the, the literature enough and, and can, you know, modify training based on, you know, getting to know athletes. And this is a little bit more holistic, I think, but getting to know them, how they're feeling, you know, and, and adjusting based on their, their training load and, you know, in-game in particular. Um, Pre-season, one of the measures I'll use is, is like, are you tight? Like, because if they're not tight, in my opinion, you're not pushing them hard enough. Mm. But if they get tight and you keep pushing them, you're going to get a, something snap. So, so it's that. subjective... I'm, yeah, and now that I move you know, into my, you know, further in my career, both coaching and academia, I see the importance, you know, it's your qualitative stuff, you know, and you hear it all the time from old guys. And, you know, when I first started, you're like, oh, qualitative, like rubbish. But I see its importance. And when you don't have much time, it's like, you, you know, the strength and you can see, you know, someone's doing a Nordic and they don't have that full control. Well, then they probably don't have the strength, right? And I bet you, I could, you can throw them on the Nord board or, or Dino. And you'll see that, that strength's not quite there. So you, you can work on that just through your coaching eye. Um, and you know, there's other things in the gym if they're not strong enough or they're not getting enough high velocity meters during the week um, or had that exposure, repeat sprint ability, um, then it's something that you've got to make sure that you include. So it's, you know, it's just trying to get to know your, your athletes and understand what they've been doing and what they also need to do. So a little bit different, I think, with my testing. Like, you know, I'm, I'm a researcher, so I like the objective stuff, you know, the valid, reliable measures. But then as a coach that doesn't have those resources, like you've sometimes got to get, you know, a little bit crafty and that, that, that takes time, you know, experience and you need to really understand the theory and, yeah. And I think it takes time to build a relationship with the athlete so yeah. the athlete then tells yeah. you the truth yeah. of how they are feeling and therefore you can individualise accordingly and or the coach's eye like he mentioned just watching them even oftentimes i've been in warm-ups how, how yeah, are they moving yeah. what's their energy right like time. right things like that mm. that's probably very important to you and how you describe things yeah yeah i agree but the um like the the buy-in like i've been at the, the elite level um and i've had guys tell me oh steve i'm, I'm my hand is really sore like and they're telling the physios that they're sweet because it's the last game of the season and they just want one more game. And they, they, you know, it's a match as well, um, which means, you know, four and a half grand, they'll get on top of their, you know, 80 or 90 grand, you know, it's big bucks, right? Like, Absolutely. and if you're a 19 year old kid, like that's playing at the elite level, then um, yeah. So it's, they've, I've built the rapport that they then trust me. Um, I probably should have told the physio, but last game, that'd be right. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. <laughs> so we're, we discussed this on a budget, uh, what we're what is available, how we might do it in a practical setting. Um, now we have 
uh, an unlimited budget lock, yeah. and you're coming mm. in, and you're... I'll get the easy question. You get the easy <laughs> question. Yeah. Oh, you're setting cool. up your, your, your performance yeah, profiling. That's, that's really important, right? So you got to first, probably first, of is, I mean, what resources do we have to work with mm. here? You know, do we have a lot or a little or, or in the middle? Um, <coughs> try our sort of fundamental principles are the same. Look, maybe as you get further up the food chain, you get more specific in this performance diagnostics becomes more important. Mm. Let's, let's face it, in the early stages, you're just going for general stuff, right? Mm. That, that's all the matter. So let's not overcomplicate it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if it was, say, you're at a pro club or something like that, they bring you in and um, got some projects now, let's say, with Super Rugby uh, in Australia, which is the, the professional league for, for rugby union, where sort of that's the situation. So you put on your sports science hat, you're like, OK, so what are we going to do here? What's, what's the question? What do they want to look at? How are we going to address it? And so you start off saying, okay, what data do we have access to and what data do we need to go further and wider to get? Can we get this data in-house? Can we get this data from somewhere else? Or can we, do we have to look through the literature to get information? And so if the further up you are, the better your in-house data is. And maybe in Australia, league-wide, they're collecting data mm -hmm. as well. Right, so that's really helpful. I'll do that in all of our major sporting codes. So from that, you can start to use that data to establish what those KPIs are within game and that's going to be critical so within game KPIs if you can establish those and get them clear and then you start to go that next step down can we draw associations between our different physical qualities so all of them right not just the strength qualities because this is what's going to inform the whole physical preparation for sport what has sort of the clear associations and what what doesn't and then from there you start to make decisions about feasibility and implementation and and um, window of adaptation, right? Um, I think what's really interesting, it's a little bit to a side, but, but Steve raised a good point, is using barbell velocity to mm -hmm. inform training. Like, it's, it is a bit of a game changer. Like, let, mm -hmm. let's face it. So a lot of what we would typically do would be, all right, here's your three sets of five at 80% one RM. But, you know, some people can do 10 reps, um, before they fail at 80%. Some people can only do six, right, but you're giving them all the same. So that's a different stimulus that the individual player is getting. So you can mm. control for that uh, using barbell velocity, which is great. But the question relating to monitoring, and if we think of monitoring as something you do on a daily or weekly basis that's kind of folded into the training process. And if we think of testing separate to that, which is done at predetermined fixed time points, um, only at a few occasions throughout the year and maybe it involves like a, a tailored day whereas your monitoring is folded in, into training. So typically, historically, what you could only really monitor, so something you could do on a regular basis without interfering with the training process, mm. would be you do something like a, a counter-movement jump mm. um, and you'd be able to monitor your, your fast dynamic strength and maybe you could do a drop jump and you'd get, be able to sort of monitor reactive strength. Um, because what are you going to test a 1RM every day? That's just not mm. going to happen, right? Um, getting, getting a whole squad through on a mid-thigh pull every week, it's not going to happen, right? It's not feasible. But being able to monitor barbell velocity during a heavy lift, that's going to give you an indicator of what their heavy strength is like at that instant in time. And you can do that now by looking at, at how fast the barbell moves for a given load or... Um, how, how much load for a given velocity. And so that opens up some really helpful insight into what their strength capabilities are at that instant in time. Because it's not just adaptations that occur over time, it's the impact of the game, right? All your training, you know, you get, mm -hmm. get smashed up on the weekend, you come in, you know, your squat's going to be down by 10%, you know, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe much more, right? Maybe you can't even do it. Or you, mm -hmm. you've had a harder training session than planned, right? But you've still got that number written down to... Um, do three sets of five at 80%, right? So mm -hmm. they're going to put on that weight, but you might not even be able to do it. So using barbell velocity helps you account for that, which I think is really helpful. So I guess back to the question, that would be my process that I would go through to... Can I, yeah? can I interrupt? So at what point would you feel comfortable for an athlete performing velocity-based training and therefore getting those measures to inform how you may individualize? Is it a matter of technical proficiency? Is there a level at which an athlete should perform these exercises that you would then feel comfortable with now um, attaining reliable measures. Oh, uh, yeah, that's a really good point. Um, yes, you only, don't use it for your juniors, right? It's just going to get in the way of your coaching, right? So until they've built up good movement competency and you know that they can do the lift well and reliably, then 
that stuff can just get in the way. It can get annoying, right? And you're dealing there with a with an iPad there while you should be there giving your attention to the performer. So you, you need to be aware of that and then be sensible with how you fold it in. Um, like I remember this is sort of a related but unrelated story from years ago when iPads first became a <coughs> thing, right? And I'm like, oh, this is going to be great. Now I don't have to have my notes or just my chalkboard or whiteboard or whatever. I'm going to have my iPad there. And so I'd carry that, carry it around, and I would try to enter in, into information while I'm coaching. And it just got in the way. It was an absolute nightmare. And I'm like, oh, nah, get that out of the way. But I'm sure there's a time and a place for it. I think, I think using velocity can be a similar thing. It can really be very powerful in many cases. As I said, I think it's, it's a game changer. But in some cases, it might just interfere with the coaching process and would be more harm than good. Steve, what are your thoughts on, on that? Mm. Well, I, uh, my ears perked up when I heard technical proficiency. There's a little, uh, little rabbit hole there, isn't there? Mm. So yeah. it's like, ooh, well, what, what, uh, what determines that? What determines technical proficiency? And it's mm. like, you know, I, I started right from the bottom in, in terms of my education and level like, cert three, cert four in, in fitness. And at that time, that must be in 05 or something around there, it was um, you know, chest up, straight back, looking straight ahead, knees hip width apart, knees can't go past the toes, and that's how you squat, only go to, only go to parallel. And for your general pops, again, you gotta weigh up risk versus benefit, maybe, right? Like mm. you don't need to go too deep because they probably don't even go too deep, you know, unless they've got um, long legs, they need to sit on the toilet, but they probably don't need to be loaded, right? But from an athletic perspective, you know, what's, what's technical proficiency? Like if you think about, mm. you know, and I'll, I'll go back to, to rugby, but any, any sport where you're, you are colliding, you know, where there's change of direction, um, you know, what is, what's the correct shape? So I guess in the gym, testing, you know, jumping, you know, sprinting, like you could pick apart, you know, the world's top 100 meter sprinters. And if they're not technically proficient, well then should they be sprinting? And some may argue, well, you know, it's the same thing from the gym then, and it, you know, I just, I'm just curious as to, you know, what is, what are we defining as, as technical proficiency? And I think my <clears throat> use of that term is more, can they replicate a similar technique over repetitions? Yeah, so the, re week like the, the reliability, like the test, retest reliability. So sure. is, there, is there movement consistent throughout, yes. even if it might not meet the definitions of, you know, maybe they're a little bit flexed in the spine or, you know, maybe there's a little bit of knee valgal movement. You know, if, if it's consistent, then... You know, or if the depth, maybe there's something to do with the, um, you know, the acetabulum and they're, they're not really good at getting deep. Mm -hmm. So maybe you don't go. So it's, yeah, I just like the technical proficiency no, and just I, wanted to speak to that. And I, I saw Lachlan's ears perk up too because he may be thinking, but I'm thinking how fatigue and other um, factors could influence then the expression of that movement and yeah. then our reliability of those measures. Yep. Yeah, maybe so that's what we're trying to deduce. Yeah, the, like the, so there are some key obvious factors, or maybe not so obvious, some important factors to consider if you're going to use barbell velocity. Like, let's just give an example. So all of a sudden, they go a little less deep on, their, on one rep of their squat. That's going to impact the, the mm. velocity, right? Mm -hmm. um, and maybe you can see that visually, maybe you don't see it because you're doing other things, that drops down. So that's going to affect it. Um, like another example might be uh, doing it power clean. The barbell hits the thighs on one rep, but doesn't hit the thigh on the other rep, mm. right? So that, that's going to impact... Um, one velocity score, so a peak, but maybe not the mean or, or the other way around. Mm -hmm. So all of those little technical factors um, can influence that. So oh, maybe that here's another obvious is your intent of movement, right? You should be intending to move explosively for mm -hmm. all of those. And as soon as you dog for one rep, right, it's going to drop down. But then the question is, as you say, maybe that's the information we're looking for mm -hmm. is, hey, you didn't drive as hard as you should that rep, and here's the evidence to prove it. You can use it that way. But yeah, there are, are technical things that will impact that score that, that you need to be aware of for sure. Absolutely. And in a group of 15, 20, 30, maybe mm. more guys, there's no way you can look at all those things on every rep. So sometimes it may be hard to do that with big groups. It is. In big groups, is, it's, always, it's always a different kettle of fish, right? You, you can talk about strategies for training one-on-one -on -one or small group, and you talk about strategies for train, training large groups and you're going to have different different requirements and different needs just to make sure everybody survives. You mentioned the counter movement jump. What characteristics do you look at when you do that for monitoring purposes? So the counter movement jump has been really well researched, <laughs> um, particularly recently. I think that's important, probably because it's 
If you had to rank order the tests, generally speaking, all your strength power tests, you'd probably put the counter movement jump at the top. It probably has, generally speaking, you know, the, the most associations to, you know, within game KPIs, outcomes and that sort of stuff. It's also easy to do. And now with the, the advent of, of accessible force plate technology, you can get a really deep dive into the, the causes of the jump, which gives you greater insight to what you have before. So I think that's been... Amazing. So you, you can do some really deep dives into it. Um, but it's also important to probably consider too, you can only get so much information out of a counter movement jump. It's just one action, just like any other action, right? So although you can pull out lots of different variables, the amount of information that's within those variables can only be so much. So if you reduce all those variables down, like through some statistical processes, it seems to cluster into just two components, generally speaking. So you can explain about 70% of the variance in counter movement jump performance by two clusters of variables. First cluster is the output, the outcome, so that'd be jump height. And anything that's really tightly correlated to that. So you know, a velocity measure or a velocity at takeoff or a flight time um, and, and a few other ones as well. So they tend to cluster together. And then the second cluster of metrics from a counter move jump seems to be the temporal aspect, so the timing of it. So how long it took you to do your action. So your contraction time, for example. That seems to be the other component. So if you're going to look at a counter move jump, you definitely want at least at least two, and you could probably get away with just two metrics. Something that quantifies the movement time, so time to take off, for example, and something that quantifies the output. So you want both of those, at least. You can start to dive a bit deeper into what caused the jump, if that's of relevance to you, that might be relevant in sports that actually involve jumping, right? Um, but to answer your question, you'll see from a monitoring perspective, which is maybe different from an adaptation perspective, monitoring perspective, what seems to occur is a change in the, the movement time as opposed to a change in the output, right? So you think you're monitoring, you think of uh, acute stress, fatigue, recovery, freshness, readiness, right? So you do a counter movement jump um, before, uh, a hard match, you can move jump after a hard match, choose your sport, right? The output metric will probably still be fairly similar, that you won't see much of a change there because athletes will just find a way. They'll find a way to get that height. But what will change is the timing of it. They will have done a longer, deeper counter movement jump to give them more time to accrue enough impulse to cause the jump height that they are trying to attain. So their strategy. Their jump strategy. So that, that's going to be what's going to tell you from a, a monitoring standpoint um, maybe what's going on. Uh, something I wanted to ask you about was the uh, – because in your paper you talked about, a lot about isometric uh, strength testing, um, particularly to get peak force. Uh, what do you think about the belt squat um, apparatus and or to, to use the belt squat as opposed to maybe a barbell squat or an isometric pull to get those numbers? What do you think about that? Because I'm really interested in the, the belt squat and how it could be just honestly more comfortable for athletes to do. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. Look at that. I haven't played with it myself. I just need an opportunity to. So I think it's really worth exploring and – I'm well aware that the numbers that we're seeing for a peak vertical force from a belt squat are higher than what we're seeing from an iso squat or an iso mid thigh pull. So that there's something there. So I think it's really worth looking at. And plus the, the athlete feels more comfortable with that too, which is huge, right? So I don't know if you've had much experience using the isometric squat. I've used both the isometric squat and mid thigh pull a fair bit. There's definitely a hesitation there with the isometric squat to push hard and fast because of that direct axial compression, right? Um, that doesn't seem to be the case with the mid-thigh pull and it certainly doesn't seem to be the case with the ISO belt squat. So there might be something worth exploring there. Um, and there's actually, this is really interesting, if you look really deep into the early literature of multi-joint isometric testing, so before the mid-thigh pull, the isometric squat, um, I think this might have been some of Greg Wilson's work in the early 90s, they actually document, it's deep in the methodology, injuries that occurred during their isometric squat testing. Interesting. They said, uh, we you know, baseline did isometric squat testing hard and fast. Uh, two athletes were injured and as a result we removed it from post-testing. If you just kind of looked at the outside of the article, you never know. If you look at that, you're like, it's kind of interesting. Then you see that yourself. So for that reason, I think the, the belt squat is, it really opens up some doors. Um, yeah, so Pat, were you going to say well, something? Well, it's interesting because in 2015 or 16 with our female volleyball team, 
uh, we began using an ISO belt squat. So mm. we actually, and Lucas helped me, we constructed, we had two Pasco force plates and we constructed a platform for them and then we had a ring and then we put the chain and we measured them and familiarized them. Um, and they were much more comfortable with yeah. the ISO belt squat. And the idea, and I hadn't seen it before, but the idea, my former um, advisor in my undergrad was Dr. Bill Sands. And Bill Sands was working for USA Snow boarding and skiing association in utah and he was using this test amongst skiers and they were putting him in a position where the torso was very bent over at a at a greater knee angle and i thought that is really interesting how he's using that um and i stole it and i said really let's look at this and, and uh, we looked at it for about a semester and what we found with our newer players they did not know how to give a maximal effort that was constraining their ability or our ability to get reliable information from the test um, and I think with the ISO mid-thigh pull, their ability to perform that lift or the mid-thigh pull and or that inclusion of that exercise within their programming may then limit uh, the reliability of that test as well. Yeah, that, that's a really big point. Um, familiarization with isometric testing, so um, whether belt squat, isometric squat, isometric mid-thigh pull, that's crucial and it takes time and it takes longer than you think. And so I've seen situations where people start dabbling with it but you can't dabble with it. You've got to commit to learning the process. Otherwise, the numbers you get are just meaningless, absolutely meaningless. So that's an important consideration with the isometric testing is the familiarisation. Um, it's important clearly for peak force, but it's even more important for the rate of force development. So that's that's probably the crucial aspect of it that, that is often not considered. Otherwise, it's just a, a random number generator. Probably a, a, really, a really important consideration, though, with maximal isometric testing is the information that it's giving you so we've all sort of come to assume that your your peak force so the the high level force you get is going to inform your heavy dynamic strength training so you, your resistance training for the very majority of it is dynamic so you go okay it's where we need to improve our peak force in the isometric myth i pull or iso squat so for that reason we need to do more heavy dynamic strength but they're they're two different strength qualities there are there is some overlap there but a change in heavy dynamic strength so let's say your your 1rm power clean or your 1rm back squat relative to the the change in isometric with pull peak force or isometric squat peak force they don't line up like you would think that they do which means that they measure two different things so that's another important consideration you know, maybe your isometric peak force is relevant and you've demonstrated that and you go to your goals to improve that. So you should have training that targets that then. But maybe it's really your heavy dynamic strength that's most important. And you can't assume that the peak force you get from your isometric test is going to give you enough information about that to fully inform your training. And that's, that's sort of an interesting finding to come to. It's a bit different for powerlifters and for weightlifters, particularly for weightlifters with the mid-thigh pull, that'll, that tracks almost perfectly with their power clean performance or, or weightlifting performance in general um, because it was designed for them. But outside of athletes whose sport it is to lift, they appear <clears throat> to be dissimilar, which is an important consideration. So let me ask you this then, to take a step further, can we trust then that a test like the ISO squat and or the ISO mid-thigh pull at those sprint-specific knee angles, does that correlate then to sprinting and yeah, it's or a, sprint speed? I don't know off the top of my head the answer to that particular question, but I'm sure you could find an association, right? And that's going to be your first step. And you would hypothesize that that would be the case. It'd be fairly reasonable to expect that to be the case and you go and test and see if it's true or not. Then what you need to do in addition to that is the next step is test it longitudinally. Does a change in one track a change in the other? And that's going to be your next layer of evidence to help support that. And you got to keep in mind, you're never going to get one for one in what, what we do. It's too, too dynamic. But you want it kind of close enough, right, and not totally go in the other direction or not totally dissimilar. So you'd go about it in, in a systematic way. Steve, at your time at the club, did you see a correlation with increases in strength, whether it be isometric and or heavy uh, dynamic strength and or speed uh, outcomes? So we didn't have the resources to, to measure their sprint speed. And we, um, yeah. so we're, we're in a little bit of a, you know, again, limited resources. 
But if you look at, you know, the, again, I will go back to the KPIs because in my, in my mind, that's all that matters, right? Like, yeah, you can get fast on the, the track, but if you, you, you don't use that when you play, then and who cares, you can be fast. But if you can't find space, find the gaps and, and get to that open field, then, then it doesn't matter. So it's a little bit tr tricky. You know, there's, there's assumptions that are being made. You know, you can sort of provide evidence because of those KPIs are high. You know, line breaks, tackle breaks, um, so forth. So it's like, yeah, we focus on, on speed and, and power training with the sleds, and then we're just going to assume that we've gotten faster because we can then show that on the KPIs. And if, you know, if we're beating other teams, then, then maybe it is the, the program that's, that's got that positive effect. So I can't answer like conclus conclusively because I just don't have the numbers and I don't like to say, you know, yes, it is because of this if I don't have the numbers. But you might assume that, okay, if you're doing the training, you know, the, the, then the heavy, the heavy resistance training, you know, with these specific, um, you know, heavy and light, okay, I think you need to train. If you all you have is lift, you know, slow and heavy, I don't think that's going to transfer, and I think everyone sort of agrees to that. But even in the weight room, you know, I'll have, you know, your, your, your moderate weight. But again, the intent of, of movement is 100% intensity of effort and then fast stuff, right? And again, that's generally always, you, you don't really need to ask. They'll move as quickly as possible, and then, you know, you go out in the field and, and you sprint. So, you, you, you know, the whole... Um, <clears throat> The whole um, force talk, velocity, yeah, torque velocity curve. You know, I'm a big advocate of, and that's that's essentially what underpins my my philosophy and, and my training and, and programming is making sure that you cover that. And of course, to the, the left side where we have our, our eccentric contractions, it's generally neglected, right? Mm. Like, how often do we do 105, 110, 115 percent of your one RM, your concentric one RM? Not very often, right? So it, I really try to put focus on that in my programs to cover that whole curve. Yeah, mm. I'd love to have the resources. And again, it just comes down, if you're at the elite level, sure. Um, and, and you've got support from the, the coach and, and, um, and the players, then, then you can. But, you know, there's, I, I hear of instances in, in um, you know, elite sport, they, they won't do a 40 metre or your 40 yard um, dash. They won't, they won't measure that because it's a, it's a risk, right? Mm -hmm. There's a risk of a hamstring strain. And if, there's, if they strain it during that, why? What's the point? You know, we've got GPS and they're, they're becoming a lot more accurate. So you can start to look at, okay, what are our numbers going to hit? But, you know, you've then got to be relying on, we don't have the best GPS either. So it's like, is, uh, how reliable are they? Um, I, I like to just, at this level, you know, it just comes down to performance. Are you winning the games? Are you hitting the, the metrics, the KPIs that, that you're after, that you're chasing? And if that's, if that's working, then, and, and we've got some good numbers in the gym, we're seeing improvement across the pre-season, we're seeing you know, a lot of in intent in the training in, in terms of the, the sprint stuff, then you know, I'm satisfied from a coach. You know, researcher, not a chance, but <laughs> as a coach, <laughs> yes. Well, and, and in rugby league, what I found too is very unique. Uh, you have a 17, 18 week preseason. Yeah, we, we, it's huge. Yeah. <laughs> Which is massive yeah. to then um, program, prescribe some of these maximal or heavy maximal dynamic strength yeah. exercises without then interfering with performance yep. or allowing them to systematically and progressively attain those higher loads over yep. time, which is massive. Yeah, yeah. And in general, you know, rugby league, or you know, most um, you know, Australian rules football as well, which I've worked in, the, the coaches are happy pre-season. You know, it's a focus of increasing your physical ability, be it strength, hypertrophy. Obviously, if you're getting kids that are coming through, you need to put a bit of meat on them. Um, you know, speed, you know, power, and they're happy for you to take up a very large chunk of the training. And of course, as you get closer to this season, you start to transition. But you know, I've been very, um, very fortunate to have coaches, you know, head coaches that are like, you know, Steve, what do you need? You know, and it's like speed, and I've, I've got to have it at the start because we're still trying to develop speed. Mm -hmm. You know, I completely understand that at the, you know, in the 80th minute, you might need to, you might have that break, and you might need to sprint your ass off to get down and, and score or vice versa, they've made a break and then you need your, you know, your wingers and your, your halves to come across and, and chase that down. But again, I'm all about developing speed and that, they do, I'm, I'm satisfied with the, the drills that they do that will give them that, you know, give them that, that stimulus. So, yeah, it's um, it, very fortunate, I think. Um, you know, you hear soccer in particular and it's everything's with the ball and, you know, I'm a bit of a traditionalist so I like to actually have, you know, break it down and, and have your, your strength, have your conditioning, you know, and everything that, that makes up those those components. So, yeah. Well, that time is invaluable, and I think mm. people misinterpret 
heavy strength training and its merit. And if its merit is to then induce neuromorphological changes, mm. in particular tissue changes that allow you to then withstand large mass specific forces under constrained times, which it seems to do, then it has its merit. Now, whether, yeah. where you time that in relation to um, more important performances or a contest, that's a whole other story. And now you have the time then relative to those competitions mm. that where you can develop that and then actualize those adaptations into a skilled movement such as sprinting. Yeah, I like it. Like you, you hear, you know, train the movement, you know, not the muscle. And I get it, right? And, and I agree. Like you do need to train the movement, but you also need to train the muscle. Like, so my philosophy is, is train for the adaptation. And, you know, we use the literature, we use science to understand adaptations and what's the best stimulus, what gives the greatest effect mm -hmm. for adaptation. And then you do it, right? And you do it for a period of time and you, you might transition. So, you know, you're trying to build more robust hamstrings, you know, to, to handle those eccentric forces during the terminal swing phase. Or, you know, you're trying to increase, you know, the, the force capacity of your, your, your glutes, of quads, of, you know, of your, um, your plantar flexors in terms of trying to improve athletic ability. But, yeah, it, it seems crazy in my mind that, you, that people think that that should just be done in, in isolation and there's not going to be anything else on either of that side to then train the movement and, and the skill. And, you know, we also need to think about, you know, putting them in the right place as well. You know, deliberate practice, deliberate play. We need to make sure that our, 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 our skills games or our focus is also evoking the, the emotion, right? There's, there's that chaos, there's decision making. Mm. You know, you've, you've got someone in front of you that's gonna smash you if you make a mistake, mm -hmm. you know? And, and also you don't know your other, your other teammates. If you don't catch the football, you've let the team down. And in rugby league, if you drop the ball, it's a turnover. Unless it goes backwards, but you know, most of the time when you're running, everyone's running forward, it's gonna, it's a knock on, it goes forward. So you need to also take that in consideration. But I think from the basics, you know, S and C coaches, train for the adaptation, then train the movement once you're satisfied with what you've got. And, you know, we use the tests, objective tests in order to inform that. And I see quite a few um, coaches who are really knowledgeable about sprinting mechanics. Mm. And I see them then working with perhaps undertrained or underprepared individuals as from a strength quality standpoint. And so are they able to then assume those positions within that skilled movement to express those forces? and even receive the ad adaptive stimulus from the increased forces by being in correct positions. And so I see it as a bit of a, okay, that looks really cute, but are we actually making improvements? Mm. I think that goes to your first point about injury and what is the most basic yeah. uh, mechanism of injury. The tissue is not able to withstand the yeah. stimulus that's being applied to it. Yeah. So your point, you know, uh, is an athlete, can you improve their mechanics enough? And if you do, are you putting them at more risk for injury, mm, mm. Uh, particularly in top speed sprinting and max velocity sprinting? So I'm curious to you in, in terms of just, you know, hamstring injury prevention. Um, what does that really look like? Because, you know, that that is a I think it's an epidemic, especially in soccer, uh, mm. hamstring injuries. They don't seem to be going down. It's, in <laughs> fact, they seem to be going up. So how do you prevent hamstring injury? <laughs> I could tell you, but then I'll be out of a job. <laughs> in, uh, yeah, look, in short, it's tough. It's so tough. If you really want to remove injury, a best predictor of future injury don't play. is previous injury. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah don't play. Yeah. Don't play the players that have had previous injuries. Clear your list out and get guys that don't have a hammy injury, and that'll reduce your injury rates. Makes you look sweet. If you've got any uh, access to the list, I don't know. Generally, we don't. Uh, that's the list manager's role. But in all seriousness, that, that's the, the easiest way. And then people will tell you, "Oh, my program, my program. You know, it's so amazing. You know, I've, I've prevented all these injuries, these hammies." But you know, then they're, they're just hiding that we, they cleared the list and they don't have those mm -hmm. guys with previous injury. They've got other guys just of the same level, and you know they're performing well as well because they've still got the, the caliber of player but then they don't have that previous injury. So that's the, that's the easiest way to, to reduce injury or just don't run fast. So right. yeah, it's, it's a little bit of a problem um, in, in most sports. Um, so look, if you, if you look, you know, you boil it down to the basics, you know, strength, you know, strength, I'm a big advocate for strength. You know, there's some evidence to suggest that yes, it is a, a risk factor for injury and intuitively it makes sense, right? If we can target that, that, that tissue, get it stronger, hopefully, you know, it can withstand those external forces, hopefully. We then need to think about, you know, um, the exposure training load, and I'll, I'll pump my ties up here. 
my first PhD paper, first author paper published in the British Journal of Sports Medicine, number one sports science journal, sports medicine journal in the, in the world, and looked at the effect of, of high speed running loads on, on hamstring strain injury risk. And it was an absolute unicorn data set in terms of 22 injuries. So we had it powered and these guys were getting pumped, like their load was up so high in comparison to their two year, because we, we looked over two years and then we, you know, we created this average and then we essentially looked at how they went, you know, how it fluctuated across and looked at each injury in particular. And yeah, they're they, you know, they getting these spikes, these huge spikes in their, 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 their training load. High speed running in particular seemed to be the only variable that had the uh, relationship. So, you know, monitoring comes down to it, um, making sure that, you know, that, that it's, you're giving enough, but, but not too much. Okay, so again, that just comes back to your, your strength, um, but perhaps a bit of fatigue there as well. And, you know, your, your muscle hasn't had time to recover. So, you know, recovery is important, and making sure that you're not giving too much um, too often. Um, I, I think they're your, your two main um, variables, factors that you should focus on, you know, is strength and also monitoring of that, that high speed stuff. So, you know, if I could tell you what's the sweet spot, you know, I'd love to, but I, I can't. And I think that's individual and individual and it, specific and it will fluctuate across their, their career, right? Like, you know, nutrition, sleep, like all of these things, you know, uh, external emotional stresses, you know, they're breaking up, having in a breakup or, or maybe, you know, they're entering a relationship and they're up all night texting and, and whatnot. So, mm. you know, it's it's so variable. Like I think if you you know you yeah you, again your meat and potatoes is your you know your strength and your your training load monitoring that that high speed running is is probably the, the factors that that we have most control of. Which you can get some good data with GPS with that because otherwise yeah. it's hard to monitor. Oh, it's impossible, especially in a team you know in yeah. practice, right? So yeah, that that is a big factor, right? Mm. Yeah, well, and you can. If you're, if you're the architect of your environment, your learning environment and or your practice environment, then you start to set up your, your activities. Then I, I know to maximize learning performance decrement, but also the physical capacities that you want to induce. Mm. Correct? So there may be ways to do that, but then again, it's going to be very individual. Right, right. Within those activities. You know, it's interesting because, you know, I know track and field athletes that don't touch the weight room and can sprint 100 meters, 200 meters mm. repeatedly, and they have no issues. You know, so to your point about strength, I'm not skeptical about that because I'm a big believer in strength mm. and developing robustness, hip-dominant strength, knee-dominant strength, different exercise modalities, but also there are athletes that seemingly have no weight room strength. But then it goes back to the uh, question of how do you define strength? Is it just a weight room number? Yeah, or is it have sorry. they adapted to, you know, high volume of running over a certain period of time? where they do have great hamstring strength or a neuromuscular output can withstand these volumes. So it's mm. not it's such an mm. easy answer. Yeah, it, they're also the exceptions mm. too, right? So, and that, that's why you've got to look at the whole body of knowledge. So you hear that, I've got a guy, never goes in the weight room, but they're great out on the pitch and I'm sure that's true. But they're the exceptions, right? That's not what the majority mm. are. So you kind of... That's, that's not what you can kind of hang your hat on a lot of the time. So when you look at all the information pulled together, that's probably the most rich knowledge that you'll get. Um, and so certainly from injury risk reduction, and it's been well documented across multiple meta-analyses, an increase in strength is going to have the greatest impact on injury risk reduction compared to you know stretching or proprioception training or anything else like that. What well, doesn't seem to have been explored so well um, within a meta-analysis, so pulling together lots of different articles, has been the inclusion of high-speed running to injury risk reduction compared to those other modalities. I think if you added that in there, you'd see, you'd see a pretty good effect. Mm. Right. Yeah. yeah, I'd agree with you there. It's yeah, certainly... Yeah. Well, and I think what's underrepresented in the literature, too, is, is research on skill and its effects on strength and research vice versa, Right. Um, does improving skill then improve strength? And vice versa, does improving strength then improve the skill? And yeah, we rarely have these studies mm, in mm. combination. It's interesting, right? So then it depends on what sort of skill are we talking about, right? right? So a skill could be, is it kicking a soccer ball? Is it doing a vertical jump? Is it throwing a punch? Is it throwing a ball? Is it your ability to perform well in small-sided games with multiple mm. plays and multiple decision-making opportunities there for you that you have to decide on. So it kind of defends, depends. Um, mm. I get in a closed skill, I think you'd be pretty confident that there's going to be some mm. good transfer there if you do it right. So, you know, 
heavy strength training, improving cattleman jump performance. Yep, all good, right? Um, throwing velocity, um, punching impact force, things like that, right? No problem. Um, so from that sort of closed skill, for sure, when it comes to those open type skills, you, there's got to be some sort of relevance and transfer there, for sure. It's just a matter of quantifying to what extent because there's not going to be a one-for-one um, it's what else contributes to that performance and I think so that's where we're talking about agility I guess too right which is the ability to change your position or velocity in response to an external stimulus and that that second part's the key otherwise it's just change your direction right. which is just sprinting right if you can sprint fast you change your direction time's going to be good so then so the question relates to does what's the relationship between an increase in strength and improving true reactionary agility mm, performance, mm. right? Where you have to kind of identify the gaps and read the play, make a decision and do that where there's this perceptual cognitive component to it. So the cross-sectional relationship doesn't seem to be there, but maybe it, maybe it just needs some more exploration. We've got a PhD student right now in, um, in professional soccer in Australia, and he's looking at the interaction between strength and agility um, in soccer players so that that's an interesting one to look for but it's a really complicated topic to to unpack um and it's, there's some complicated literature underpinning that too steve and i were just talking about that recently yeah, the whole ecological dynamics mm. approach to it which which is really can be a bit overwhelming mm. and agility can mean different things to different athletes even within the same sport so looking at positional demands mm. Agility means something completely different for a quarterback and an offensive lineman in American mm. football. You know what I mean? So it's really hard to quantify. It is. Yeah, it's probably the hardest thing. And, you know, go to, go to presentations that talk about training agility and then the question asked is, well, so, so how do you test it then? And the answer is, well, well we don't because there's, there's no validated test and it's a, mm. that's a whole PhD in itself to mm. find one for that sport or for that position mm. within a sport. Right. Right, so then a lot of it just becomes your your coaching eye, right? Okay, that that's an improved performance qualitatively. So, so that's a like, complicated one. Then it's like, do you just leave it up to the sport coach? Because as me, as you know, as the strength and conditioning coach, am I going to provide the best stimulus of agility training for their skill for their sport, mm. or yeah. am I just adding mileage on to their body and you know mm. what I think is going to be super helpful for that athlete? It's like, okay, maybe I just leave that component to the sport coach, but. You know, I don't know. I just go back and forth even in my own head on that. What do you think? I think it depends on their level of development and where you're at in your training year because you may want to then prepare them with more um, or less difficult tasks mm. in order to then improve the physical capacities then to sustain or be healthy than when task-specific practice takes place, correct? Because then you can manipulate certain demands of it to then improve certain aspects of strength or physical capacities. And that might then lend itself to their preparation. Right. I think it, I think it provides a, a great opportunity for collaboration right. between you know, sports coach and S and C. You know, sometimes there's a bit of a rift there between the two departments, especially if there's a few more L's than W's. Mm. But I think you know, if you you work with that, that 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 specific coach, and you try some stuff in the gym, and he's got some stuff that he's doing on the pitch, and you know, you can then see are they improving their performance on the field in games and if they are beautiful like that's a really nice story to tell the head coach so that you keep your job for the next year <laughs> but i think like that's you know it, you can then get crafty again like let's try this in the gym like this agility will it transfer maybe maybe not maybe it's just bring it to his attention as well that's also going to drive you know the um the adaptation he's doing some more stuff on the field a little bit more in the gym and then it might just all piece it together even if it's just a one percent or two percent in the gym you know even stuff on the field you know a little bit more you'd expect builds his confidence a bit more. I think that there's so much to bring into it, but that's that's my approach. I'd be looking for a little collaboration with the sports coach and, and seeing if you can put something special, like a really special individual individualised program for that, that particular player. I think it's a fantastic opportunity for collaboration mm. and also learning for both parties. Yeah. And then how yep. do we periodize or plan these <clears> over <throat> time? That's, I think, where the magic lies. Mm. So how do you manipulate these constraints within an agility session over time? To then influence their physical capacities, but also their perception coupling, right, to then attune to more task-specific cues. And are those relevant to your context? And they may become more relevant as you get into sport-specific practice. Which means you must be on the same page as the sport coach, because if you're trying to do all you can to periodize and, you know, 
plan out all this exact yardage and reps and sets and velocity and constraint, and then they're going and being destroyed by the sport coach in their practice, mm-hmm. it doesn't matter at that point. So you have to collaborate. You have mm-hmm. to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I, I mean, destroyed then means that, well, you're not on the same page, and therefore you, you, may, you may have to get there or you won't be in the same book. Right, that's my point. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's the same yeah. as you guys first. Yeah. 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 Um, so you mentioned future projects, and, and just to wrap up, Coach, if you're okay, um, where do you see the research in this area, particularly in strength diagnostics, going for you? Yeah, th- thanks for asking. Um, got, got some things in the works. So that, that article that we were referring to is really like a review, right, you know, sort of a narrative review, trying to, trying to simplify things in a really pragmatic, practical way, but we're still evidence-based. So what we need to do is, re- and where we've just about finished this right now, is pull it all together, go out there, assess as many athletes as we can across all the tests that we can, see where the relationships exist between the tests, see where they don't, and see what metrics and test clusters together, see if it lines up with that or if it's different, and then from there we can actually have stronger evidence one way or the other. So it'll be the first step, and then the, the second step to that is seeing how that changes longitudinally over time, so how stable those domains are, um, in response to, let's say, different phases of a competitive season, so really key phases. Um, and then as part of that to the, the transfer of training from the development of one to the development of the other and really getting a good handle on what that looks like um, in a nice kind of clean study where it's all being pulled together nicely. So I think that's the, that's the next step for, for that, that topic. Fantastic. And, and Steve, feel free to jump in. Where do you see your research going? I know you have an NSCA yeah, uh, yeah. Presentation coming up. Congratulations. Thank so. you. Yeah. So the reason, main reason why I'm over here is, uh, yeah, so we had a little research project that started in at the start of 2020. And <laughs> if we remember, it was a yeah, pretty uh, major worldwide event that um, transpired. So we were actually, um, yeah, a little bit of a story here before we uh, wrap it up. But um, right. yeah, you know, I received a grant, early career researcher grant. I got a PhD student, he moved over for Austria, I recruited a, an RA, and we travelled around Australia and, and went to um, numerous NRL and, and AFL clubs. And so we, we wanted to look at trunk morphology, in, the, in, in particular cross-sectional areas of quadratus alborum and um, multifidus. We also want to look at trunk strength and you know, it's something, you know, being in the field, you know, you hear coaches in particular talk about, oh, you can be strong in your trunk and your posterior chain and, you know, it's, it's a very loose definition. It's like, you know, your core, there's so many, there's not one, you know, <laughs> definition. So, you know, it was something that, you know, from my coaching itch, I wanted to, to scratch. And so I got this grant, I got this PhD student, this RA, we travelled all around Australia, Melbourne, Sydney, Adelaide, you know, up to Brisbane. Um, and we collected all this data and, and funny enough, I actually used to go to Wuhan. Um, I'd been there three times in, in the past 18 months leading up to that point. And so I was watching on the news because it was a, I'd go over and teach and you know, it was a, it was, it was a good little opportunity um, that I had over there. And I was watching it and it's like 20, 20 people are dead in Wuhan from this virus. And I was like, Psst. there's like 20 million people in the greater Wuhan region, 11 million in the, the city. I was sure. like, yeah, that's, that's not many really. If you think about percentage, the next day 50, I was like, still not bothered. Next day 100, I was like, ooh. And then as we know what happened. So as a consequence of that, we'd gone out and collected all this data. So we looked at morphology, we looked at strength. So I combined a couple of different uh, methodologies. So the, the first was the Baron Sorensen test, which is a, it's a strength endurance test where you strap yourself to a plinth. Okay, if this is your, your hip, you essentially, you, you're here. Um, and you lift yourself up and you hold it. And it's a pass fail. You've got to hold it for four minutes and give it a go. It's really, really tough. It's horrible when you can't dip more than three times past like 10 degrees. Mm-hmm. And so I pulled some, a methodology of, 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 of trunk flexion and extension from a BJSM paper, uh, Corona and colleagues, and they had this validated strength test. And it was, it, I didn't quite agree with the, the rest period and so forth, but essentially it was, it was a five second MVIC, five second rest, 45 second max contraction, so a fatigue inducing um, rep, and then you'd have another five, five second um, MVIC. But for this particular project, we had the, the first five seconds, five second rest, and then 45 seconds. And it was the peak of the, the five second max effort and then the mean of the 45 second. And we had, you know, we had over 200 athletes, 220 or, or thereabouts. Um, it was scary. So if you don't know, the um, 
the AFL and, and NRL were on the, the brink of saying no season. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. very, and I was like, what are the chances that I run a prospective study the year we have a pandemic? Like, it's crazy. It's crazy, right? And so I was stressing. And lucky enough, they did go through. They changed the, the quarters. They reduced it in, in AFL. So they, they didn't play as many minutes in the quarter. And that's obviously going to have impact on exposure, right? Mm -hmm. You need exposure to get injured. Mm -hmm. um, and then the NRL actually delayed the, um, the season quite a few weeks. And it went into spring. And of course, spring, it gets hot in Australia, depending on where you are. But the, the, northern, the northern areas in particular starts to get really hot. So that's then going to have an effect, right? Because you've got to start factoring in hydration and, mm -hmm. and, and so forth. Um, so I, stress, I was stressing really hard. It was, um, oh, I was gutted. But uh, we, we got it through. We, um, and so yeah, out um, at Vegas um, to present some, some of that work, just looking at morphology and, and, um, and the effect of isometric strength and I'll say posterior chain, mm -hmm. but um, you know, trunk and hip strength. Um, so essentially in that, that protocol, um, instead of strength endurance, we, we put a, a custom made harness across the, the trunk, the torso. And then we had a, a, a rope with a, um, a force a transducer um, in between that and where we anchored them to the floor and we just had them pro uh, produce those forces so it was, they, they couldn't move, mm -hmm. it was isometric. And we found that from a, a hamstring perspective, those that had lower maximal strength, so that first five second, the peak in that first five second, and also if you had a lower strength endurance, mm -hmm. then you had a greater risk of hamstring strain injury. So, so quite a nice finding from a, a perspective of isometric, mm -hmm. um, its relationship to hamstring injury. Nothing with, with the, um, the knee ligament risk, but you know, I think we, we're fairly confident to say that it's not strength that's a, a risk factor, it's more of coordination, muscle coordination mm -hmm. patterns and making sure that you know, the right muscles are being recruited and good luck trying to do that from a coaching perspective when they're sprinting right. Like I think we just might leave that one alone. <laughs> um, but yeah, you, there was um, you know, a little, um, uh, little association with lumbar multifidus. So a bigger lumbar multifidus, and this is sort of against the, the, the current evidence, um, but a bigger multifidus, greater risk of, of knee ligament injury. But of course, you know, these are big beasts. The majority of them were, were NRL players. Mm -hmm. um, and we know BMI is a risk factor. So if, you, you know, if you've got a bigger BMI, it means that you, the, and these guys have got more muscle. Mm -hmm. So you're probably gonna have a bigger lumbar multifidus anyway, right? So that, that's mm. where I would make that link between you know, a bigger, bigger body, um, greater risk of, of knee ligament risk. So that's, that's something that I'm presenting now. It's, it's, it's had its first uh, round of revisions um, in, a, in a good journal, very good journal. Mm. So hopefully the, um, those findings are out soon and published for everyone to read. Yeah, Fantastic, yeah. fantastic. Coach, do you have any other questions? No, I just wanted to say I appreciate you guys' time and, and uh, jumping on last minute. Um, <laughs> and uh, I really appreciate you, know, you setting this up and uh, I think this was had a lot of value, so I can't wait to get it out. Excellent. Fantastic. Thanks for thank having you. us, guys. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank can't you. Thank you guys enough.